Have a Bible open, please, at 1 Peter chapter 3. One of the big reasons that we Christian believers can find ourselves feeling that we do not quite fit in with the world around us, strangers in the world, as Peter puts it in this letter, is that there are aspects of the Bible's teaching that we find, frankly, embarrassing, at least awkward. We're aware that there are some of the things that the Bible teaches that give offence to many in today's world. And this is very difficult because it's not just that our friends and our colleagues and the media and so on disagree with some of the things that are found in the book that we Christian believers understand to be the Word of God. No, they regard them as morally unacceptable. It is, as Peter put it in chapter 2, verse 12, we saw last week, they accuse you of doing wrong, just being Christian. Or as the ESV puts that, they speak against you as evildoers. If you believe that, then you're a bigot, a misogynist, intolerant, cruel, exclusive, oppressive, unjust. Now, despite how it might feel, this is not really a new phenomenon. Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and a few others have amplified these attitudes in recent times, but it's clear that the first readers of 1 Peter were experiencing much the same thing. They speak against you, you believers, as evildoers. Now, I wonder if you can relate to this. Are there aspects of the Bible's teaching that you find Frankly, if you're honest, embarrassing. Because in today's world, they do not seem morally right. Well, if the Bible is God's word to us, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and as Christian believers know to be true, then we need to see that if we find something in the Bible, something the Bible actually teaches, morally disturbing, then it is either because we have not understood the Bible teaching properly, or our sense of what is right and what is wrong is unreliable, or perhaps both. Now, friends, I've begun like this today because... As we come to the first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 3, we come to just such a subject in today's world. Many in today's world take deep offence at what we read in these lines. Indeed, many Christian believers find what we are about to hear together embarrassing because we know how offensive it is. If you believe that then you're a bigot, you're a misogynist, you're cruel, you're oppressive, you're unconcerned for justice. Over the next few minutes together, we are trying to do something rather important. Namely, to listen carefully to the teaching of this little part of the Bible about husbands and wives. We want to understand what the Bible actually teaches and how and why God's word to us is good, better than anything anyone else has to say. Well, let's first look at what is said here in 1 Peter chapter 3 to wives in verses 1 to 6, and then to husbands in verse 7. First to wives. And the first thing we will notice is the phrase in verse 1. Do you notice it there? Chapter 3, verse 1 in the same way. Well, if you're in the mood to take offence at anything you hear today, you might as well start now. Because when Peter says, 
in the same way. If you've been reading the letter right through, as we have been over, la over recent weeks, you could think that he's about to say that wives must behave like the slaves that he's been talking about at the end of chapter 2. Look back to chapter 2, verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Now, chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. Well, that's a bit hard to take, isn't it? It confirms the world's worst suspicions of uh, what, the Bi what, what the Bible is teaching, doesn't it? You believe that? Ha, huh, just a minute. Cast your eye down to verse 7. What does it say there? Husbands, in the same way. Ah, those words, in the same way, tell us that there is something the same about how Christian slaves are to behave and Christian wives are to behave and Christian husbands. And what is the same is that it's what we were hearing about last week, namely that Christians, slaves, wives, husbands or anyone else, are people whose lives have been touched by the death of Jesus Christ for us. That is what Peter was talking about at the very end of chapter 2, do you remember? And if you were a Christian slave in the first century, the death of Jesus for you and his behaviour as he died was to profoundly affect how you behaved as a slave. It made a difference. And now Peter says to us this week that if you're a Christian wife or a Christian husband, the death of Jesus and how he behaved as he died for you is to profoundly affect how you behave as a wife or as a husband. So in the same way, they're very important words but don't go getting offended too quickly. Let's read on in verse 1. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. Well, there are words that are almost scandalous to our ears today, aren't they? Why did I say almost? But I'm hoping that we can make the effort to understand what is really being said here and why. First, let's think for a moment about what be submissive means, really, in this context. Does Peter mean that a husband has the right to his own way and a wife should just accept that? Is that what he means? No. That is not what he means. What he means. Does he mean that whenever there is a dispute, it's the wife who must give way? No. He does not mean that. Does he mean that a wife must do whatever will please her husband? Again, no. And let us, friends, be very, very clear. These words do not for a moment ask a wife to accept any kind of mistreatment from her husband. If we hear these words suggesting any such thing, I'm glad that we recoil from them. So we should. But they do not mean that. And I hope you don't mind me saying, any man who uses words like this from the Bible to justify any unkind behaviour towards his wife should, frankly, be ashamed of himself. But you may reasonably ask, how do you know, how do we know that Peter's words do not mean those things? Well, because Peter was there when Jesus taught his disciples to reject the pagan concept of human relationships based on power, where the more powerful person lords it over others. The person in authority is the boss. Remember what Jesus said? Not so with you. 
Indeed, he said on that occasion to his followers, for even the Son of Man, that's Jesus himself, the man with more authority than any man or woman who has ever lived, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And when you get that, everything is changed. You see, what does it mean for us to submit to Jesus? It means to be served by Jesus. It means to have him give his life as a ransom for us. It means to have Jesus giving himself for us, caring about us, serving us, in a word, loving us. So in this revolutionary way of thinking, Peter learned it from Jesus. We learn it when Jesus' death for us touches us. What would, what would it mean for a wife to submit to her husband? Well, it would mean accepting her husband's self-sacrificial care for her, putting himself out for her, in a word, loving her. Now, of course, there is mutuality in this, but the point here is that a Christian wife does not look for independence from her husband. Wives, be submissive to your husbands means wives, respect honour and welcome your husband's responsibility to love you. It's not about power, you see. It's about love. Importantly, Peter does not just have in mind here wives with Christian husbands. It seems that in the historical situation, a number of women were coming to faith in Christ while their husbands did not. And so one good reason for such wives to submit in the sense that we've seen is, verse 1 again, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. These husbands had obviously heard the gospel message, but they didn't believe it. They didn't like it. How might they be one for Christ? By their Christian wives going on and on and on and on about the gospel? Telling their husbands over and over and over again that they're sinners? Pestering them to come to church with them? That's not the advice given here. The wives of husbands who were not yet Christians are called to win them over by their godly lives, even without a word. Well, Peter elaborates this point with what I think are perhaps his most controversial words for us this week. It's about the kind of beauty that really strengthens a marriage. On the one hand, verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold, jewellery and fine clothes. Contrary, of course, to everything that we are taught by the media and by advertising and by celebrity. Now, of course, Peter is not saying that Christian wives should wear shabby clothes and never wear jewellery and never do their hair. But he is saying that the whole beauty industry in the ancient world, as well as in today's world, does not understand true beauty. Doesn't understand what true beauty is. Because if your eyes have been opened to what life is about, you see that makeup and jewellery and expensive clothes do not matter. Not really. Do you believe that? Verse 4, instead, your beauty should be that of your inner self. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. When we are touched by the death of Jesus for us, what matters to God starts to matter to us. What is unimpressive to God starts to be unimpressive to us. Next time you stand in front of a mirror, men and women, it wouldn't be a bad thing to ask, 
What matters to God? What is unimpressive to God? And Peter says here that what is really beautiful is a Christ-like character. That is something that doesn't fade with age. Indeed, it grows more and more beautiful as the years go by. Do you believe that? Look at verses 5 and 6. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Abraham's wife Sarah is a particular example of women in the Old Testament who displayed the kind of qualities that is, Peter is commending here. It's fair to say that Abraham and Sarah's life together had its moments, like all marriages. And it's not really being held up here as an example to follow in every respect. But Peter points to the heart of their relationship and what it would mean to follow her example. Do what is right and do not give way to fear. Christian wife, do not let fear determine the kind of wife you become. Not fear of your husband, that should never be part of a marriage, nor fear of the opinions of others. Do what is right and do not give way to fear. Well, with this little passage, there are many questions left in the air. Our passage doesn't try and cover everything. But I want to ask us to consider what we have heard, not what we haven't heard. And I hope we can notice that all that we have heard so far is relevant to men as well as women. If wives are to submit to the loving kindness of their husbands, that is because husbands are called to self-sacrificial love for their wives. If wives are to strive for a beauty that is deeper than makeup, then husbands are to appreciate and treasure such beauty. Well, now in verse 7, we have Peter's very brief word to husbands. We noticed the words in the same way earlier. Husbands, too, are to be affected by the death of Jesus for them. How? Look at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Be considerate is literally, and I think this is a bit better, live according to knowledge, according to what you know. And if you know God, that must affect the kind of husband you are. What does that mean? Verse 7 again, treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Two reasons for respect. Here. One is that the wife is usually the physically weaker partner. How shockingly terrible it is whenever a stronger person uses their strength against a weaker person. If you know God, you must never do that. After all, how has God treated you? But even more than that, your wife, and here it's assumed that the husband has a Christian wife, is an heir with you of God's gracious gift of eternal life. You, husband, you're not better than your wife in the eyes of God. He's loved you both exactly equally. He has given you both exactly the same privilege. And a husband who gets that will show honour towards his wife. Jesus died for her. Don't you dare look down on her in any way. And finally, Peter's words to husbands and wives close with this motivation at the end of verse 7, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The most profoundly wonderful thing that a Christian husband and wife can do is to pray together. It's hard. It's very hard to do if you're trying to be independent of each other. 
It's impossible to do if you're not honouring each other. I wonder, friends, if you can see the goodness of what we've heard here today. What we've heard is, of course, still offensive if you think that human relationships are about power, about who is in control, about, and, 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 and you know, life is, is, you know, is about competition, it's competitive with those who win and those who lose. But the death of Jesus for us teaches us otherwise. Human relationships, and especially marriage, are about giving, not taking. About love, not power. And I think it is simply sad when a person cannot see how good that is. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good gift of marriage. And we want to pray for the marriages in our church and indeed marriage, marriages far more widely. But we pray, Heavenly Father, for Christian marriages and Christians in marriages. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, the goodness, that the goodness of this gift might be clear to us and the goodness of your ways would be clear to us. We pray for Christian wives, we pray for Christian husbands, that we would be deeply impacted by Jesus' death for us in the way in which we treat our partners, the way in which we care for our marriages, the way in which we love our families, and the way in which our love for each other spills out to others around us. We pray that your word to us today, so controversial in today's word, world, we pray that we would understand it truly, see its goodness, and love to heed it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.